Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Hi there and welcome to Better System Trader. This is episode number 127 and in this episode we've got something really special organized for you here. This is the first in a special two-part series on building mean reversion trading strategies and to discuss mean reversion with us we have a special guest, someone who has been on the podcast before a couple of times already and our guest is Cesar Alvarez from Alvarez Quant Trading. Now, those of you who know Caesar's work would be aware that he is a mean reversion specialist. He has a wealth of knowledge on mean reversion trading. He's going to share a lot of that with us over this special two-part mean reversion series. So I'm really excited to be sharing it with you. Now, in this first episode, Caesar is going to be discussing the high-level steps we need to take to build a mean reversion trading strategy, how to select a trading universe, and how to find mean reversion setups using simple but highly effective techniques. He also shares with us how to identify better quality trades by combining indicators. And he he gives us some really interesting insights into why strategies with a smooth equity curve may not actually be the best strategies to trade in the future. Also, if you have any mean reversion questions you'd like to ask Caesar, then I'll tell you how you can submit questions for him, which we'll answer in the second episode in this series. So listen out for that at the end. I'll tell you more about that afterwards. Anyway, let's jump straight into this first part of the two-part Mean Reversion series with Cesar Alvarez. Hope you enjoy it. Hi, Cesar. Welcome back. Thanks for coming on the show again. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I'm always a pleasure to be here and talk to your listeners. It's been actually been quite a while since you were on here last, but from memory, the last one we did was um, you were talking about some stops, uh, stop loss techniques and exit techniques based on some research that you'd done. And that was really a very popular episode. So I'm looking forward to having a chat to you today because we're also going to cover another popular episode, uh, another popular topic, and that is mean reversion. So I think a lot of people are going to find this one interesting today. Now, um, before we get started, how about, can you just give us a quick little bit of background on yourself for people who uh, perhaps didn't catch the other episodes? Yes, I've been doing quantitative trading since uh, 2004. I spent uh, nine years working with Larry Connors, and that's where I learned all about mean reversion. I mean, he's, he was a big mean reversion trader. Uh, and he really popularized at that time using the two period RSI for mean reversion. And that's, you know, I learned all my skills there as a quantitative trader. I left about four years ago uh, to go out on my own and, you know, do trading on my own and to write my blog. I just really wanted to write a blog and, you know, uh, give back to other people and write about various research I like to do. And my, most of my trading is based on stocks and ETFs. And a lot of it for the longest time has been mean reversion trading. I do do other types of um, strategies like trend following, uh, breakout strategies. But I'd say definitely my my bread and butter and, you know, where where I really like to do research is on the mean reversion trading front. Yeah. So what is it actually about mean reversion trading that really appeals to you? I I don't know if it's because, you know, that's what I learned first from Larry Connors. You know, and that's, you know, kind of got got ingrained through me Mm. uh, through the years. Or I think a lot of it is I like the fact that it tends to be a short term trades, usually, you know, three to seven days. I like those shorter trades. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a day trader. I've tried it before. And that's, I just, that's definitely not me. And, you know, waiting, holding, you know, a month or two months, that, that kind of time period tends to be a little bit on the longer side that, uh, you know, also is not really for me. So I, I like the, I guess, you know, we're all trying to get something out of the market and that, the action level at mean reversion trading is kind of like the right level of action. Yeah. And also, I also like it because it it tests your uh, fortitude. Definitely, that's one thing that mean reversion does. And, <laughs> yeah. um, something that, uh, you know, we'll hopefully talk a little bit more about that a little later. So you mentioned there that uh, mean reversion can test your fortitude. So can you give us a little bit more uh, information about what's good and bad about mean reversion trading? Yeah, I mean, one of the, like I said, one of the bad parts about mean reversion trading is when you look at these charts, often you'll see a stock that's just going straight down. And one of the hardest part about mean reversion trading, in my opinion, is 
placing your order after looking at these charts. And for this reason, I purposely don't look at the charts 95% of the time, I'd say at least, or don't even look at the symbols. Um, because if you look at these charts, you're going to be going, why the hell do I want to even buy this stock? It's, it's clearly in a downtrend. It's not going to bounce. And often those are actually the best ones. You know, So that's you know one of the hardest parts about mean reversion trading. Hmm. Uh, one of the things I really do like about mean reversion trading is it's got a pretty good win ratio. Usually in the mid 60s, so 60, 65% is often where your um, winning percentage is, which is quite nice. And you can get some nice winners really quickly. So, you know, like I said, recently I had this last week or so, I had like a 10% winner in like uh, one day. This thing just <laughs> bounced like crazy. So, you know, that's one of the nice parts about mean reversion trading. Uh, the other thing I like about it is, you know, these are quick holds. You know pretty quickly within three to five days whether you're in a good trade or not. Um, yeah. So, you know, those are all the things I really like about mean reversion trading. Yeah. Okay. So if we look at this from a, a higher level, then when we're, when we're looking to build mean reversion strategies, what are the steps that we need to take there? Yeah. So the steps are very similar to any other strategy. Um, you know, you've got to figure out, you know, what your goals are for the strategy. You know, you know, are you looking for high returns, low drawdowns? So that's, as always, for any strategy, you got to figure out what trading universe, you know, are you going to be trading S&P 500 stocks, small cap stocks, whatever. Uh, of course, the main part of your strategy is, you know, how are you going to measure mean reversion? You know, how are you going to measure, you know, the stock is sold off? And, you know, that's, you know, that's the core part of the mean reversion. So we'll definitely spend a lot of time there. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, what other filters are you looking for to add to your, um, to your strategy? So those are that. And then, you know, you know, often you, you know, do you want your strategy to be trading all markets or just certain market regimes? So that's another important part. Uh, and then, you know, the ranking of your signals. When you have too many signals, you know, it's important to understand how you rank them. Uh, of course, always important is position sizing. You know, how do you, well, what kind of position sizing are you going to do? Uh, very similar to that is, you know, how many positions, max and normal positions are you going to have? You know, that's also important. It has very interesting effects, which we'll discuss then. Uh, and then, of course, your entry. How do you get into the position? Once you've got a signal, how are you going to get in? Um, and then, you know, what happens if it continues to scale, um, to sell off? Do you want to scale in or not? And then the most important part is your exit. How do you get out? So those are, you know, very similar to any other strategy. Um, but we'll discuss more in detail each of those. Yeah, so there's quite a few steps and considerations there that you mentioned. So let's just start at the very first one, uh, goals and targets. So when you're building mean reversion trading strategies, what are you aiming to achieve? Yeah, so I mean, when anybody's developing a strategy, they need to focus, you know, they decide what metrics they're focusing on. Everybody's got their favorite metrics and, you know, looking at them. I personally tend to look at compounded annual growth rate, uh, the maximum top five drawdowns, and also look at the draw lengths. And um, one thing I, for the longest time, I looked at was smoothness of equity curve. And now, lately, I've actually been looking at, I would say, the inverse of that is I don't want to see smooth equity curves. Because, and you may be going, wait, why? everybody wants, you know, everybody looks for smooth equity curves, and that's the reason. Is everybody's looking for smooth equity curves, and therefore any strategy that you find that has a smooth equity curve, you know everybody else is be going to. So lately, I've been looking at you know strategies that don't have a smooth equity curve because they're likely not to be as followed as much by other people. Right. Okay. So how are you actually measuring the smoothness or the non-smoothness? Um, I have a um, formula that was given to me by another fellow researcher friend. Um, basically, think of it as a um, linear regression formula in the mm-hmm. simplest sense, and it produces a value and basically I just look for values that are not near the, you know, don't, don't say near the most smooth. So, you know, the value it produces is just a number. Uh, it, it's not really a bounded number. So, you know, let's say the numbers range between 300 and 500. Mm. Therefore, I won't look at any of the strategies that have got, you know, values over 400 or something like that. Uh, just so I'm not near those smoothest looking strategies. Mm. But if, if you're looking at strategies that aren't so smooth, have have you found that they they are less robust in real life trading, or does that not kind of um, match what you've seen? I actually think they're probably going to be more robust. I mean, I've only been doing this for for the last year, and I've uh, so far they've been behaving quite well. I think by looking at smoothness as equity curve, I think we may be fooling ourselves into thinking you know, that that smoothness will continue into the future. When you've got this very, you know, if you can have an equity curve that's bouncing around a lot, but yet still producing good returns, to me, actually, that seems to signal a little bit better that it can deal with more different good and bad um, trades as versus a smooth equity curve. I think that's fooling you to thinking you will always just have good trades and avoid the bad trades. Yeah. Uh, and if you're trading mean reversion, 
you will wake up one morning with a stock that's down 50 percent um you know it's you know unless you're trading sp 100 or 500 stocks but if you're trading a much larger universe i can guarantee you that's going to be one of the things that happens to you um and um yeah, that's one of the hard parts of trading mean reversion. Mm, yeah. Okay. So let's move on to trading universe then, since you just um, mentioned a few. So what do you look at? Uh, what um, markets do you look at when you're uh, trying to build uh, mean reversion strategies? Yeah. So this is definitely something that you know, again, like a like your metrics and what goals are. You need to decide you know what kind of trading universe you want to go with. You know, you can trade. You know, mean reversion happens on you know SP 500 stocks or Russell 3000 stocks or even stocks that aren't even on in any index. The you know the biggest difference is how you know how big the moves are when they finally do bounce. And you know if you're trading SP 500 stock, you're not going to have a, that stock likely go up five, ten, fifteen percent. Um, but also at the same time, you're not going to be the likelihood of being an SP 500 stock that opens down fifty percent is very very small. But if you're trading Russell 3000 stocks or even stocks aren't in, in any index, those stocks, you know, it is quite likely that it may be up 10, 15, 20 percent. I had a trade last week that I was up 15 percent in it, um, but it's not, a, you know, it's, it's not an S&P 500 stock. Now, I can guarantee you, you know, sometime over the next year, I will wake up one morning and there will be, you know, um, it will be yeah, I will have a stock that's down 30 percent or 50 percent. So a lot of it has to be, you know, what, you know, can you deal with the, that volatility, that possibility of a large draw, um, large opening gap down? If not, you know, you maybe should stay with the SP 500 stocks. Mm. But at the same time, your returns for the SP 500, your strategy that you can develop from that is going to be, you know, you may be able to get strategies in the 15, 20% annual returns versus if you go to Russell 3000 or stocks aren't an index, you can easily start seeing 25, 30, you know, or even higher annual returns. Uh, and then if you want, you can go to some of the um, foreign stock exchanges where you even have more possibility of you know, larger returns. So that is part of that there is deciding, you know, what can you handle? Because a lot of quantitative trading is about, you know, being able to push the button each each day when you see those setups. Uh, you know, that is one of the harder parts of quantitative trading that people don't believe, especially with mean reversion. Uh, you know, you'll so, I'll sometimes look at a chart for a mean reversion trade and it's like been going down, down, down. And I'm thinking, why would I want to buy this? And I have to not look at the news or try to look up the news because as soon as I, you start doing that, you're becoming a discretionary trader. So, you know, you just have to be able to understand that and just push those buttons and let it go. Yeah. And for those stocks that are kind of um, outside those popular indexes like the S&P 500, um, some of those smaller ones can have... Uh, liquidity issues and and things like that. So, do you think it's wise to kind of filter out some of those stocks that that could have some issues like that? Yes, definitely. I mean, part of it depends on you know how big your account is. You know, if you're only trading a thousand dollars per position, then you can afford to go into smaller illiquid stocks. But if you're trading twenty thousand thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars per position, then you can't trade those smaller stocks. Uh, you know, you need to take into account you know how much. The volume is so I tend to use uh, a dollar volume, and you know I don't want to see myself you know anywhere near you know a one percent of the daily dollar volume uh, because if I'm there you're probably going to be affecting the price. And then what's going to happen is you're gonna you won't be able to do you'll have to do something like a TWAP order or VWAP orders to get in and out. Um, also along those lines is um, a minimum price. So depending on how your commissions are set up. You may not want to trade, you know, stocks less than a dollar. Uh, you know, I have a per share commission. So if, you know, if I wanted to buy $5,000 of a 50 cent stock, that's 10,000 shares. And using my commission structure, that's quite a bit of an expense on the commissions mm. and that can eat up to any profits. So that's another thing one needs to be looking out for. Um, you know, those low price stocks tend to be really good me reversion trades, but they also tend to eat up your uh, commission. So you, that's another thing one needs to take into account. Yeah, that's a good thing to consider, actually, the impact of um, transaction costs on those lower price stocks. But how do you, if you have a price uh, filter in your strategies, how do you actually handle the impact of um, stock splits? So uh, I guess, for example, perhaps uh, maybe Microsoft, I think, at the rem- at the moment is around the $60 mark. But if you look at a price chart for Microsoft, 
um, that's been adjusted for splits, you know, way back in the 80s when it was floated, it probably says it was like 20 cents when really it was maybe $20 at the time. So how do you account for that type of price adjustment? Yeah, I mean, that is a great question. And that is, you know, a lot of people run into that mistake. You need to have a good data provider that uh, ha- gives you the uh, as traded price. So somebody like Norgate Data, who I use, has what you, you can ask. One of the things you can ask for for it is, you know, give me the actual traded price. So back to Microsoft example, you know, in 1985, I'll tell you the price was, you know, $25 versus, you know, 32 cents. So yes, that is definitely very critical. And I think, you know, the, the farther you go back in time, your back testing does, goes, mm. the more important that is. So if you're only testing the last five years, you know what, you probably don't need the split adjusted price. But if you're going back 20 years, uh, you probably really do, uh, really do need that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we've talked about trade universe. So let's get on to um, uh, entries, I guess, and and how to measure the actual um, mean reversion. But before we do that, I just want to confirm. So I think you said at the top um, that you you really only trade end of day timeframe. So is that what we'll be talking about today in that kind of context? Yep. Yeah, so this will all be on the context of daily charts, uh, on you know daily bars, not weekly, monthly, or intraday parts. Uh, that's ninety nine percent of my research and trading is done on the daily bars uh, time frame. So this is that yeah, this this will all be on that time frame. Yep. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, let's talk about. There's probably a um, hundred different ways you can do this, but uh, how do you? How what kind of techniques can you use to measure uh, the mean reversion on daily charts? Right. So, you know, now that we've got our trading universe and we got our price now, you know, of course, here's the meat and but, you know, really the meat and potatoes part is how do you measure mean reversion? And there are, like you said, hundreds of technical indicators out there. Um, and they all, you know, especially you can use a lot of them to measure mean reversion. Um, my, you know, the one I popularized with Larry Connors back in the, um, you know, t- over a decade ago is, you know, the RSI, the two pair RSI is a, a really good one for the short term indicator. It's, uh, you know, it, it still works quite well. I'm always, I'm always surprised when I do research that how well it still works, even though it's been popularized for a long time. Mm-hmm. And now that's a very common one. But there's a lot of other ones that people don't think about. Uh, one is using Bollinger Bands and what's called percent B. Uh, percent B basically takes where your close is in relation to the top Bollinger Band and the bottom Bollinger Band. Uh, if you're closed at the top Bollinger Band, the value of percent B is 1%. If you close at the bottom Bollinger Band, the value is minus one. If you're closed right, the moving average, the value is zero. So one good method um, that I've used before is saying that the percent B value is less than, let's say, point minus 0.8 for two or three days in a row. That's another good way of measuring mean reversion. Uh, so, you know, those are two, I'd say, two of my most popular ways of doing it. Okay. So I think I don't recall what the default values are for Bollinger Bands. It might be 20 on the moving average and two standard deviations. How does the the length of the the mean and the number of standard deviations impact the uh, mean reversion strategies? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, the length I typically use for that is a, uh, a five or 10 period, so kind of much shorter than the, the typical. Yep. And for the standard deviations, that one very, you know, varies anywhere from one one and a half or two um you know these are values that you could uh test and optimize on to see kind of what you know which trade you're getting to see and what you like um they all will work it's just a matter of you know how how much of a pullback are you looking for you know and that's you know th- that's the way i do it with the bollinger bands yeah and so what are some of the dangers of reducing those um the length of those uh, values um i mean the the real danger is is that you're just going to be getting more trades. So you just have to watch uh, at any at any time you're creating a strategy. You just need to balance your number of trades that you're getting because you know you can make them either very stringent and you just don't get that many trades, or you make them very loose and you're just getting too many trades. So as as with any indicator or any strategy, you're, you're always playing a balance of how you know how often are getting trades. And especially with mean reversion, mean reversion, you know, especially doing quiet pairs like that now uh, can be can be very tempting to loosen up the parameters such that you can get enough trades. Mm-hmm. Uh, that we'll talk a little bit later about market regimes, about how, the importance of that. Okay, cool. So I cut you off when you were talking about measuring mean reversion. So did you want to move on to some other techniques that you prefer? Yes. I mean, there's lots of techniques and I would say there's none 
as to which one one chooses, it's a matter of, you know, trying them out, seeing which ones you like, which ones you don't like, you know. Uh, moving average is another great, simple one to use. Uh, I've used this one in the past also. Something like, you know, how, what's the percentage away from moving average? You know, how far am I below, let's say, the five, per, um, sorry, the uh, five day moving average? So I would say, okay, if I'm more than 4% underneath the five day moving average, I'm in, you know, I would consider I'm in a pullback. Mm-hmm. Or you can also, as, as with any of these indicators, you can do it as a multi day. So I'm more than 4% below the five day moving average for two days or three days in a row. Then that's your part of your setup for meet, meeting the mean reversion. Does that one, uh, uh, makes sense to you? Yeah. So uh, when you're talking about percentages, are, are you accounting for the volatility of the stock as well? Um, no, I do not uh, account for the volatility of the stock. Uh, you can do that. I normally don't. I've, um, in general, I tend to find simpler. I tend to go for simpler. And whenever I try to account for the stock volatility, it never seems to add enough for me to justify the complexity. But again, that's something, um, you know, each individual needs to decide and say, okay, I want to account for the volatility of the stock. And, you know, the percentage below is dependent on the volatility of the stock. Yeah. And what about the type of moving average? Because some lag more than others, like a simple versus an exponential. So do you do you care about the type of moving average that you're using there? No. I've, I've, uh, when you're that short, I usually find that it doesn't make much of a difference. Uh, but again, you know, if you prefer one over the other, it's not going to make that much of a difference. Um, or you can test them both out and see if one actually – you know, for whatever reason is making a difference on your trading universe or because of the other rules that you've got set up, it may make a difference. Yeah. Okay. Another one I use is very simple. It's the rate of change. Basically, you know, how much has a stock dropped over the last three days or five days? Uh, again, uh, I tend to do use, use a fixed amount. So I'll say something like, you know, the stock's dropped uh, 15% over the last five days. Uh, but again, you can make that volatility based. Mm. Uh, and that's a very simple, you know, that's a very simple, obvious one. Uh, it's one that I do use. It's, uh, it's like I said, very simple one. A lot of these mean reversions ones are also highly correlated. So, you know, uh, but, you know, that's, that's how I use rate of change. Yep. Any questions on that one? No, that one's, um, <laughs> that one's pretty self-explanatory. Well, the next one's even more self-explanatory. And this is days down. Basically, you just count how many days a stock has closed down. Um, you'd be surprised. To, this is the simplest one, how well this actually works. If you say, okay, I want to see a stock that's been down five days in a row, you'd be surprised how well that simple rule would work. Um, I remember you know, when I first tried looking at this, it's like, oh, this can't be that easy. And you know, it, it, it does work. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the challenge with, with that type of um, measurement, though, is that sometimes you can get stocks that are trending down and will have a number of days down in a row. It doesn't necessarily mean it's ripe for a mean reversion. Yeah, and what you can do in those cases uh, is say, you know, it's got to be down between five and let's say 10 days or some value. So if it's been down more than 10 days in a row, you just say, forget it. I, you know, I'm not even going to enter that. Um, but it doesn't, you got to remember, even if a stock's been down five days in a row, it's, it, it's, um, you know, it, it may be a perfect mean reversion. It sometimes takes a while for the RSI or the Bollinger Band or any of the other indicators to get low enough to in, to trigger a mean reversion trade. And usually it's the three to five days down is usually what it's looking at. Yeah. And are you just looking at open to close or do you also consider uh, lower lows, things like that? Uh, that's another way. You can do – I usually do uh, close to close. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you can do lower lows. That's That also works quite well. It's just, you know, the lows have been lower. Or, or you can combine them. You know, that you want, you know, lower lows and lower closes. Those are all just, you know, simple, easy ways of combining a very simple idea into working into a mean reversion trade. Yeah. Okay. So the next one is uh, what I uh, call a multi-day closing range. So I, I look at, let's say, the highest high over the last uh, five days and the lowest low over the last five days. And I see where the close is. And normally I, I want something like the close to be in the bottom 10% of that range. And that normally tells me, okay, you know, it, that's another way of looking at, for a sell-off. Um, typically, I do it in the, either five days or ten days, yeah. and you know, the values I'm looking at is usually ten percent, you know, the bottom ten percent uh, of that. Yeah. So, do you wait for a, that level to be breached first, or do, are you looking for a kind of a confirmation that it's it's going to bounce before you uh, take notice? Um, I actually just look with uh, a breach. I mean, most marine reversion trading. Waiting for a confirmation, waiting for the bounce will quickly eat up your edge. Mm. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's something I discovered years and years ago. I thought, oh, wait, let me wait for a confirmation, wait for it to bounce, start that bounce. And what happens is 
you lose a lot waiting for that confirmation. Mm. Yeah. So I think you just said there that you look at a like maybe a perhaps a five day closing range. Can you actually use shorter periods than that? Uh yes, you can. I mean, um, but like I said, I typically I use like a five or a ten day uh, closing range. Just this measured because what I'm trying to do all these indicators here. I'm trying to measure a pull back on a daily chart. So it's like, you know, if you look at a daily chart, it kind of looks like, yes, the stock has pulled back some. Mm. Um, you know, that's the heart of a mean reversion trade is so, uh, on a daily time frame. Yeah. The next, um, another very simple idea is just looking for uh, an end bar uh, closing low. So uh, something like a seven day closing low, uh, you know, something that simple. It's like, okay, it's the lowest low or losing closing low the last seven days. And that could be also another great confirmation of um a closing range it's similar to the closing range but it's you know this in a sense is asking it in some respects to close you know at zero uh that that's another pop another good one to use hmm. so the next indicator is um the connor's rsi i think i'd be remiss without mentioning that one um that one's already got set parameters that one um with the set parameters does a really good job of uh finding mean reversion trades i'm always um quite surprised i'm doing a little research right now on it right now and again i was surprised on how well it's been holding up yeah and so conceptually what's the difference between a connor's rsi and a standard rsi so conceptually connor's rsi is combining three different um indicators uh it's combining an rsi uh actually days down and what um, a rated change you know those three it's combining those three into one indicator uh and so and it's uh, it's in a sense you know a I don't know a super indicator or I don't want super is the right word a, <laughs> it's, it's a super indicator I don't know it's combining three <laughs> indicators into one yeah okay and also uh, I noticed a couple of weeks back on your blog you posted a um, an article on an Ellers indicator yes so I'm always looking for new indicators I'm not married to any one indicator um, you know as much as I like the two pair dire side and a couple of the others and percent B. Uh, you know, I'm always looking for something. And uh, about a month or two ago, I saw an article about an Eller indicator. And I've always wanted to try some of his indicators. So I went and, you know, and coded that up and gave it a, a try. And yes, it, it does seem to work pretty well also as a mean reversion indicator. Mm. So, you know, if again, you know, always be on the lookout for other indicators. Um, you never know. Or even current indicators are popular. You can turn around and use as a, you know, as a mean reversion trade, you know, moving average is not obvious how to use that as a, as a mean reversion indicator. But, you know, once you realize, oh, you can look at a percentage below that, that becomes a mean reversion indicator. So again, I wanted to look at the L indicator and that one is definitely, um, has some good potential too. Yeah. Okay. All right. Do you want to move on now to the combining of indicators or stacking indicators? You've mentioned quite sure. a few kind of indicators there that look at uh, mean reversion from different angles. So, how do you or what are you looking for when you're combining these indicators? Yeah. So no, you know, you can do, you know, you can choose just one indicator and just use that as your, you know, your trigger for a mean reversion trade in a sense, or you can combine them. And there's two ways in combining them. You can, in a sense, have um, you know, something I would like to use is something like an RSI and a days down. So, in a sense of the days down is confirming, you know, it's helping to confirm the RSI. You know, you've got two indicators confirming that it is a mean reversion trade. So, you know, I normally will combine uh, two indicators together uh, to kind of give me confirmation that the that there is a mean reversion trade. But you can also kind of do um, something slightly different and it's do – and I've done this also before is where I take two indicators and I just I I tune them such that the signals from them are very stretched trade. So I'll look for a very low RSI value. So let's say RSI value less than one and a very low, let's say, percent B value. So a value, you know, a couple of days under minus one. So both of those occurrences don't happen very often. But when they do, they tend to be quite good trade so i'll I'll do them as an you know I'll, it's one or the other happening so not necessarily they're confirming each other but yeah. that you know i know when these happen they had to be very good good ways good trades so those are just two different ways of combining them you can either do this confirmation or you can make them very strict and just say okay i know these don't happen very often but when they do happen they tend to be good trades so those are those are two ways to combine them i would not combine you know three maybe 
four or more no i think that's you just you're getting to having too many rules at that point you yeah. know i yeah. i would stick at one or two uh you know pick the one or two that seem to make most sense for you yeah okay and what, what do you need to be careful of when you're choosing combinations because um some of the techniques you just mentioned there are very kind of similar to each other and i mean you even mentioned that connor's rsi has a couple of things included in it so combining that right. connor's rsi with something else may not actually make sense too much so what do you what do you need to be careful of yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, you just need to understand a little bit of how they're built. Like you said, combining a Connors RSI and a regular RSI probably would not be that helpful. So, but it's understanding of that, that, um, you know, a Bollinger band and a stretch from the moving average that, you know, the, using the percent B, they're similar ish. Mm. But again, you know, there is going to be high correlation to get with all of these indicators. And it's a matter of, you know, having a little bit of confirmation when you have two of the indicators you know, giving you a buy signal that tends to be a little bit better uh, uh, confirmation that this is a good trade. Or like I said, or you just tune them such that they're very strict uh, and give you very rarely give you trades. But when they do, they're good. So you can now do two of them that way. Yeah. Uh, so all the techniques that you've, you've kind of mentioned there are over multiple bars, but is there anything you can look at for like the most previous bar? Yes. And this, I think, helps a lot. One of my favorite indicators to have is a uh, closing range, the one day closing range. So I'll, you know, I'll take the high, the low, and look where the close, uh, closes in that range. That, I think that last bar. So you've got now a multi day pullback. And now you want to see on this, this current bar, you've got a pullback on that bar. So this, you're just looking at pullbacks on multiple levels. Um, and you get a closing range, like in the bottom 10% and the bottom 25%, I found quite often really helps the returns. Uh, another thing to do is your, um, one day return. And there's two ways of doing this, just saying, you know, today's return is, you know, it's gone down more than 2% or 3%. Hmm. But a way I like to do even better is to say is something in uh, Ami Broker, which is a backtesting platform I have, have something called a percent rank. So I take today's one day return and compare it to like the previous 100 days. And I want to see it as being one of the worst, you know, uh, the worst 10 or oh, the worst 10 of those 100 days. Does that make sense there? Yeah. So, you know, I'm just looking at today's down day is one of the worst of the top 10 mm. of the, you know, of the last 100 days. So those two concepts really give you that intraday kind of like gives you an extra added boost of mean reversion. Because you got to remember, part of mean reversion is you're dealing with psychology of, you know, people out there finally giving up and saying, I, I want out of the stock. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so that makes sense. Thank you for explaining that. So are there any other kinds of filters or indicators that you use when you're looking for these setups? Yes. I mean, I'll look at other things. Uh, one thing quite often I'll use like either 200 day or 100 day moving average, you know, that I want to be above that. Cause at the end of the day, I do want the stock to be in an uptrend. Um, you know, cause these stocks, you know, a mean reversion trade that can keep going down, 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 uh, for a very long time. And, you know, if it's above the 200, it's less likely to be happening. Um, also you like to use ADX, um, something like a uh, five or 10 period ADX just to make sure that's good. It's got good strength with it. Yeah. Uh, but again, I try not to use too many of these other filters. And again, use your own favorite filters. These are kind of things, extra little things that I'm looking for to tell me, you know, these are the type of stocks I want to be trading. Uh, other things I'll sometimes use is uh, historical volatility. You know, sometimes I want a stock to be very, you know, to have some volatility. So I'll say the historical vol, the 100 day historical volatility is above 40 or 50. Or sometimes if I'm doing a strategy that I don't want to have lots of volatility, I'll do the reverse of that. And I'll say I want the historical volatility to, to be less than 40. Mm. So, again, these are additional little filters that I'm looking for. I try not to have too many here. Again, the more rules that you have, the more likely that you're going to, you know, you'll walk into the curve fitting, overfitting area. Um, but, you know, understand why you're adding a rule. And, you know, that's, you know, I, I do use some other filters. Yeah. So when you're looking at ADX, do you also take into account the um, – the uh, what's it called DMI uh, plus and minus? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's funny you should ask that. Just I laugh because uh, a researcher friend and I were just discussing this. Okay. I normally don't, uh, even though it seems to make sense that you should. But I normally what I just use between the if I just use like a MA two hundred and just the ADX that kind of captures the whole concept of the PDI M MDI. You know, of the PDI being above the MDI. Um, Right. So you know, I, I normally just the ADX. I just want it to be to be larger, such that it says, "Look, the stock is moving." So again, you know, 
you don't you want a stock to be have some movement. You know, you can have a pullback on something that's going very, you know, but is very shallow and it's not telling you not gonna have a very big bounce. Hmm. Yep. Okay, well, thanks for explaining that about uh, the additional filters. Now, I just want to ask one final question before we um, start finishing up for this first uh, part of the series. You made a comment about um, having the setups, uh, having the parameters kind of stringent or loose to get more or less trades. Have you found that, that for you, has there been a particular kind of direction you've taken with regards to um, having stringent or loose parameters? Uh, yes, uh, I actually tend to favor having the stringent parameters. Uh, the, you know, every, I've done it before where I've, you know, volatility, you know, died down, not this recent, um, volatility dying down, but a, a past one. And I made them loose and, you know, because I wasn't getting trades. And then what happens is when volatility picked up, I just got crushed because I was just getting too many trades. So I personally tend to be on the stringent side and understand that, you know, at times like now, you know, I, you know, I just don't see that many setups and it's, you know, that's just part of the, the strategy. And I have other strategies that are, you know, that deal better with the low, um, with the lower volatility time frame. You know, and that's the important part of any strategy is understanding the market conditions that it does well in and what it doesn't. So, you know, you know, I, like I said, I prefer the stringent, but, you know, some people would like the looser. Just because you know they, you know they, they they want to see a little bit more trading. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Cesar. Now I think that kind of leads nicely into what we're going to discuss in the next session. So do you want to just give us a quick rundown of the topics that we'll be talking about next? Sure. So uh, we'll be continuing with the setups. You know, we've we all have done these setups, but there's more to this. Um, you know, in creating your strategy, and I'll be discussing market regimes. You know, sometimes you know depending. You may want to have your strategy only trade during certain market regimes. Uh, of course, we'll have to deal with, you know, what happens when you have too many signals? You know, how do you rank your signals? Uh, position sizing, always very important how you do your position sizing. Uh, similar to position sizing, it's just how many positions you can uh, maximally take. Uh, that actually is something that's not discussed quite often, but there are some interesting um, reasons to consider a smaller versus larger number of positions. Then we'll be talking about our entry, you know, how are you getting into the uh, position? We'll talk about uh, scaling in, whether that helps or not, or how how different ways that changes your results. And then, of course, how do we get out our stops, exits, and of course, you know how you know that's the end of the trade. How do you get out? Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds uh, very interesting. Looking forward to having a chat with you about those um, those topics in the second session. So, thank you very much for your time today, Cesar, and uh, looking forward to our next chat in a few weeks' time. Well, thank you, Andrew. Always a pleasure. I'm looking forward to finishing up the topic. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thanks so much to Cesar for sharing his knowledge on mean reversion so far. This episode was a great start to this two-part series, but there is much more to come. So look out for the second episode due to be released in just a few weeks' time. In the meantime, if you do have some questions on mean reversion that you'd like me to ask Cesar in the second episode, I've set up a page where you can submit questions for him. However, it's only going to be open for a very limited time, so you need to get in quick before I shut it down. So if you'd like to submit some mean reversion questions, head on over to the website, bettersystemtrader.com, click on this episode, which is episode number 127, and scroll down the page, you'll see that there is a box to submit questions. Now, I do recommend that you do that right now. I'll be traveling through the States the next few weeks, so time is limited, and I'll be shutting down that form pretty quickly. So get your questions in right now, and we look forward to hearing them. So we hope you enjoyed this episode, and look out for the next one with Cesar. We've got much more mean reversion goodness to come. Catch you then. Okay, well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Come on over to bettersystemtrader.com. That's where you'll find all the previous episodes, all the transcribes, all the show notes, and all the free weekly trading tips. bettersystemtrader.com. Bettersystemtrader.com.